Journalism is not really a profession in the true sense because it does not uh, meet any code of conduct or standards. Of course, it's expected to do well, but uh, there's no re regulation yeah, or even self-regulation so far as journalism is concerned, or very little of it. Unlike professions like the law, like uh, accounting, uh, medicine, and so on, where uh, certain standards are prescribed and there is a regulatory framework where you're held to account or you're supposed to be held to account. Uh, and disciplining journalism is a very difficult business. But uh, there are attempts to increasingly uh, raise professional standards. And there are journalism schools and so forth which attempt to do that. But what is journalism? It's, uh, it's easily recognized, but it's very hard to define. And uh, journalism, as it has evolved in modern times, is probably best understood and I quote from a definition here from Adam Stewart, Professor Adam Stewart, it's best understood as a form of expression or brain work that includes making news judgments, gathering evidence, constructing narratives, and very important, making sense of things. A form of expression or brain work that includes making news judgments, gathering evidence, constructing narratives or storytelling and making sense of things. And also as a method of capturing and representing the world of events and ideas as they occur. There are many cynical characterizations of journalism, that's literature in a hurry, uh, the pursuit of superficiality and dilettantism for the most part and so on. And I won't go into that, but at its uh, uh, serious, in a serious sense, uh, it is what, uh, you know, this definition, I think, will do. In an interesting book, a significant book, a uh, British journalist who has also taught journalism at City University London and elsewhere, George Brock, is a veteran journalist. In his book called Out of Print, Newspapers, Journalism, and the Business of News, he uh, identifies four core tasks of journalism. Journalism for the 21st century. And I think most people, uh, most journalists would agree with it, which, you know, whatever priori however you prioritize it. And these four core tasks are verification. Journalism is often called the discipline of verification, but it has to go beyond that. Sense making, bearing witness, and investigation. So verification in no particular order verification, sense-making, bearing witness, and investigation. And uh, Brock rightly characterizes these four as the irreducible core of what can be distinguished as journalism and uh, the foundation of, on which journalism in the 20th century is going to be rebuilt. So journalism can be understood as investigation, at least in large part, and over the last uh, half century or so, there has been an ebb and flow of investigative journalism across the world, including, of course, in India. Related to this, but separate from it, there's been an ebb and flow of public and political engagement with the results of investigative journalism in response to larger tr events, trends, and issues in politics, economy, culture, society, and, of course, uh, international relations. Now the next question that arises, what is investigative journalism? When it comes to definition, there is a surprising lack of agreement among practitioners and scholars in the field. But let us uh, cut through all this and agree on the proposition that investigative journalism is the discipline of digging deep and bringing to light verified facts about wrongdoing or about a matter of significance which are either sought to be covered up or are otherwise inaccessible to the public. Investigative journalism is often largely about wrongdoing, investigating and exposing wrongdoing, but it is more than that. There could be a situation of uh, mass distress 
leading to starvation deaths. It's happened in India and Andhra Pradesh and elsewhere. And often it, you know, the symptoms are silent. And only when it reaches a crisis point do the media get uh, interested in the matter or get, uh, uh, start reporting it. And then investigation may start. So uh, there are matters of significance, not always amounting to wrongdoing, that uh, get missed. But there's active cover-up as well. So I think let us agree on this simple proposition. Gabriel Garcia Marquez, who started out as a journalist and uh, remained engaged with journalism and journalism education all his life, has a clear view on the central role of investigation uh, in, in journalism. Interestingly, it's a viewpoint shared by many old world journalists. In a wonderful little meditation titled Journalism, the best job in the world, not many would agree with that, but Marcus repeated, emphasized that journalism is the best job in the world, even though he went much beyond journalism. And this was delivered in Los Angeles in 19, uh, 1996. And uh, the writer puts forward the view that the education and training of young journalists must, quote, rest on three pillars, three central pillars, the priority of aptitudes and vocations. There must be a passion for the uh, vocation. There must be an aptitude which is passionate, which is committed, which is deeply engaged. The certainty that investigation is not a professional speciality but that all journalism should be, by definition, investigative. And the awareness that ethics are not an occasional condition, but should always accompany journalism, like the bus accompanies the blowfly. That's like the bus accompanies the blowfly. So Marquez, in other words, tried to demystify the business of investigative journalism, because very often investigative journalists uh, claim to be an elite cadre in journalism, that they do what uh, garden variety journalists don't attempt to do or are not capable of doing. And Marquez would have none of that. And it's not just him, a number of old world journalists who uh, share this view. And in fact, the term investigative journalism was not known at all uh, uh, for a long time, till the 70s or so, when uh, uh, the Watergate scandal broke. And there were great investigative journalists before that. The, for example, the Sunday Times in the UK had the Insight team. And uh, many injustices and horrors were exposed before that. And also in India, you had quite a lot of investigative journalism in the late 19th century and the early 20th century as part of the freedom struggle, exposing the scandals of the British Raj. But they were, not, they were not labeled investigative journalism. So the, there is much merit in the proposition that all serious journalism has to be investigative. And it's not some uh, super speciality in journalism. But uh, this doesn't mean that there should be no specialization. In fact, increasingly, investigative journalists need to specialize and master various techniques and tools. Uh, data journalism and uh, forensic accounting, forensic architecture, data visualization, and so on. These are at least frontier fields today, not yet been mainstreamed, but they are, uh, they are able to discover things that uh, 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 normally are, uh, are hidden. But at the center of it is a question of meaning. And... Uh, without uh, merely scatter, you know, amassing facts on issues doesn't get you anywhere. And it's, uh, it's just uh, routine work. Uh, but as long as fact gathering, verification uh, is followed up by analyzing, analysis, and attempting to make sense of the story, apart from storytelling, I think, uh, that's where investigative journalism takes off. So while investigating, exploring, and experimenting, journalists of the first rank are not satisfied with bringing to light a mass of material facts that they manage to unearth through diligent work or that falls under their lap. Very often, it's a luck. 
it's a stroke of luck. Their real pursuit should be to invest these hitherto concealed or inaccessible facts with social, moral, and often historical meaning and weave them into a coherent and compelling story so that the journalism contributes significantly to raising social awareness of the issues involved and also stands the test of time. And uh, I can give you a couple of examples. Uh, a, a, a little known story by Marquez called the story of a shipwrecked sailor, sailor when uh, the young journalist Marquez, a story of uh, Velasco, originally published in a Colombian newspaper, and Kenziburo Oi's Hiroshima Notes, which began in 1963 as an on-the-spot report for a monthly magazine and was completed uh, in 1965. These are unlikely to find uh, a place in case studies and textbooks, but as investigative reporting, hard worked, meticulously researched, imaginatively conceived, and beautifully written, they certainly will stand the test of time. Both won the Nobel, among other things. I would argue for the wide angle approach to uh, investigation. It does not mean that, as I said, news organizations should not increase investigative bench strength. In fact, on the contrary, as Brock points out, uh, this is going to be increasingly important in the journalism of the future, which faces many challenges. Uh, and, there, and there's a place for forming special investigative te teams. Newspapers like The Guardian, The New York Times, do uh, uh, devote considerable resources uh, to uh, developing these, uh, uh, these resources within their newsrooms. But it does mean that the larger pool of journalists educated and trained in the precepts and practice of quality journalism can be drawn into the task of investigation uh, a larger number than, the, uh, than current professional practice allows. Motivating and empowering this greatly enlarged pool of young women and men to do thorough, uh, thoughtful, and carefully supervised investigations into subjects of social and moral significance could have dramatic effects, I believe, in terms of developing capabilities, improving work culture, and raising quality in the profession. Now I will turn to, more specifically, to the Indian situation and uh, uh, what the challenges to all journalism, but particular investigative journalism in particular, uh, are about. There was a time when I believed and proclaimed in various forums that when it came to freedom of speech and expression, and by extension, the freedom and independence and general state of the press, India was in an enviable position, certainly in relation to every other developing country. That was about 40 years ago, when the socio-political and as a prominent part of it, the news media environment seemed more open, more capacious, and more welcoming than it had been at any time anyone could recall in post-independent India. The polity seemed to be unusually open to a choice of directions and paths it might take. English language as well as Indian language daily newspapers and magazines, liberated from their enslavement and inglorious role during the authoritarian emergency of 1975-77, seemed eager and energized to take full advantage of the new opportunities that had opened up, especially for Indian language newspapers. Uh, and uh, there were opportunities for accelerated and expansive growth relatively unfettered functioning and unaccustomed commercial success, a phenomenon described by the political scientist Robin Jeffrey as India's newspaper revolution. He wrote a book on it. And even more importantly, for significant sections of the mainstream press, there were opportunities for playing a more meaningful, energetic, and effective role in the striving for a democratic, progressive, and just society. It was a time most newspapers, journalists, 
and their representatives, representative bodies were unusually vigilant against any encroachment on their entitlements and, st and status as the so-called fourth estate. But if I were to claim anything like that today, I would be accused uh, or be vulnerable to the charge of purveying fake news or disinformation. If I claim that India is an, in an unenviable position when it comes to freedom and independence of the media, I think uh, I would be justly accused of purveying fake news or disinformation. When we speak of the state of the press in a country, the factor that readily comes to mind is freedom. Freedom from any kind of oppressive or arbitrary interference by the state and its instrumentalities. Such interference can take the form of suppression, censorship, intimidation, violence, and any kind of unreasonable regulation, legal or otherwise, which has a negative or chilling effect on free speech. It can also take the form of authoritarian control by communal or extremist elements. And uh, I, I don't want to get into too much detail or name names here, but you know that uh, there is an overarching climate of intimidation and fear in India today. And very often, journalists hold their hand. There is what is known as self-censorship. Uh, there, there, there used to be, the, the, you know, uh, Humpert Wolf said this about uh, the British journalist, half only half in jest, and it goes something like this: You can't hope to bribe or twist, thank God, the British journalist, but considering what the man will do unasked, there is no occasion to, and that I think uh, fits such a situation very well today. Um, the outcome is not just uh, an overawed press and news media, at least for a large part, but manufactured consent and crawling when you're only asked to bend uh, on a scale not seen since the emergency. To use a famous phrase that uh, Mr. L.K. Adwani used about the performance of the Indian press during the emergency, you crawled when you're only asked to bend, because that was said earlier by somebody else, but it fitted uh, that situation. And I think today we, 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 have, we are resembling something like that. Although there is some resistance. I'll come to that in a minute. All this has not uh, escaped the attention of close foreign observers of the Indian press. For example, Max Rodenbeck, South Asia Bureau Chief for the Economist, former chief, ob observed that the government had aggressively and quite effectively bullied much of India's mainstream press into towing the party line. Uh, and uh, 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 Rasmus, Rasmus Nielsen, who is director of the Reuters Institute for the Study of Journalism in Oxford, has also commented on the creeping quiet spreading across India's otherwise loud and lively journalism. And there are any number of articles in the foreign press uh, on, this, uh, on this subject. But more seriously, if you look at, uh, this is not just a new phenomenon. It's got worse, but this has been in the making for quite a long time. In 2018, India ranked 138th from the bottom among 180 countries and territories figuring in the annual World Press Freedom Index, compiled by, uh, by reporters uh, without boundaries, a Paris-based independent organization that dedicates itself to freedom of information. In a comparative reckoning where the worst score was 88.87 and the best 7.63, India's score was 43.24, exactly the same as Pakistan's. And uh, RSF, uh, if you, you can look it up, uh, it gives the, you know, it discusses this issue, why, and so on. The, uh, the, there's, 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 it's not just one organization that uh, has given India such a poor ranking, uh, but it's, this is, a, this is a, there's virtual consensus on this. But the bad news does not stop here. 
The Committee to Protect Journalists, known as CPJ, after careful inquiry and strict verification, has documented the work-related killings of 1,354 1, journalists worldwide, including 50 in India since 1992. That was the year the New York-based independent nonprofit founded in 1981 to defend journalists worldwide from danger and the fear of, rep fear of reprisal, began to compile data on journalistic fatalities across the world. Of the 50 killed in India since 1992, 35 were murdered in retribution for or to prevent news coverage or commentary. And the remaining 15 lost their lives while on dangerous assignments or on, or on crossfire. So we're talking largely about journalists killed or murdered in connection with their work, not in some private dispute. Uh, and this has been strictly verified and documented. A breakdown of the subjects covered by the murdered Indian journalists is interesting and revealing, is grim in fact. Politics, 20. Corruption, 21. Crime, 11. There's an overlap. Some journalists cover by, you know, more than one subject. Human rights, 8, and so on. Uh, the numbers add up to more than the total shown because many of the targeted journalists, as I mentioned, covered more than one subject. But uh, it's notable that politics, that those who report, reporters who covered politics, corruption, and crime figured heavily in the list. While no correlation can be detected between the murders and the governments in place in the states and at the center between 1992 and 2018, it is significant that the overwhelming majority of the murders were committed against journalists reporting, as I said, on these subjects. But uh, the CPJ's research does suggest that communal and other forms of divisive politics and social polarization across India have made the situation worse. Ten journalists were murdered across India over the decade beginning May 2004, but in the four years beginning to May 2014, We've already seen the death toll rise by another 12. And it is not as though only defenseless local reporters working in remote locations have been targeted by the killers. Experienced journalists write, like Gauri Lankesh and Sujat Bukhari writing against communalism or investigating corruption or working for influential news media are also part of the rising toll which suggests that journalist murders might be going through a process of deadly normalization in the system. And here is a quick, I'll just quickly go through this list of murdered Indian journalists from May 2014. Tarun Kumar Acharya, stringer for a local Oriya language television channel and a local Local newspaper, uh, local newspaper. His body was found with his throat slit and injuries in his chest in a desolate area in Orissa. M. V. N. Shankar, a senior journalist working for Andhra Prabha, a Telugu daily, died in hospital after being beaten with iron rods in Guntur district in November 2014. Jagendra Singh, a, a freelance journalist writing for Hindi newspapers and on Facebook, died in a Lucknow hospital with terrible burn injuries after being doused with petrol and set on fire allegedly by a police officer who raided his house in Shah Jahanpur in Uttar Pradesh. Karun Mishra, a bureau chief of a Hindi newspaper, mortally wounded while traveling in a car by gunshots from three assailants on motorbikes in Sultanpur district, Uttar Pradesh. Rajdev Ranjan, a bureau chief for, the Hindi, for a Hindi daily, shot dead at close range as he was returning to his office in Bihar, in Siwan, Bihar. Gauri Lankesh, editor of Gauri Lankesh Patrika, gunned down as she was entering her home in Bengaluru in September 2017. Rajesh Mishra, stringer for the, for a, for a leading Hindi, for the leading Hindi daily, Dainik Jagran, shot dead by assailants on motorcycles while he was outside his brother's store 
in Brahmanpur, a, a, a town in Ghazipur district in uh, Uttar Pradesh. And uh, Sudeep Datta Baumik, an investigative reporter working for a local Bengali newspaper, shot dead at point blank range at a battalion headquarters near Agartala, Tripura, by a trooper allegedly under the orders of a Tripura State Rifles Commandant. The case is on. Naveen Nischal, a stringer for the leading Hindi daily, Dainik Baskar, deliberately run over by a sports utility vehicle uh, while riding a motorcycle on a highway in Bihar, 2018, March. Sandeep Sharma, report, a reporter for News World, a local television channel, deliberately run over by a truck while he was riding his motorcycle in Madhya Pradesh. It's quite well spread out, isn't it? Bin, Bin district to, in March of 2018. Sujat Bukhari, a former Kashmir correspondent of the Hindu and the editor of Rising Kashmir, shot dead near his office in Sirinagar in June 2018. And the last one, Chandan Tiwari of Aj newspaper, who was uh, abducted, brutally beaten up, and died in Jharkhand. So I think uh, th th there's plenty of evidence to show that journalism, and particularly investigative journalism in India, is a very dangerous pursuit, especially if you are in a small town if, uh, uh, and defenseless. You may be working for a small newspaper or uh, television station or for a big newspaper like Danik Jagran and so on, or you could be an editor also, but you are vulnerable wherever you are. And now I think, as I said, uh, it looks like it's becoming normalized. What is as shocking as the rising number of journalists' fatalities and proliferating violence against them is the fact that the killers and assailants regularly go unpunished. This impunity is a phenomenon not just in India, but in also in several other developing countries where authoritarian rulers, typically elected and functioning under the cloak of democracy and extremist political movements, have little time and tolerance for independent journalism, especially investigative journalism or journalism as investigation. Investigative journalists especially are targeted as enemies of the state or of the party or of the individual political leader, or of the extremist movement. Since 2008, the Committee to Protect Journalists has been publishing an annual Global Impunity Index, a quantified ranking of countries where journalists are murdered, the cases remain unsolved, and no convictions have been obtained. In other words, the index is a graded indictment of countries where the rule of law does not seem to apply when journalists are murdered in the course of their work. And uh, the 14 countries appearing in the latest index, which came out in 2018, uh, account for close to 80%, these 14 countries, of the unsolved murders of journalists worldwide for the decade ending August 31, 2017. India, along with uh, six other countries, has figured in the Global Impunity Index every year since the index began to be compiled. It can thus be described as a founding member, a permanent member of this club of shame. In December 2013, responding to campaigns by journalists, journalist unions and professional associations and organizations like the CPJ, the UN General Assembly established November 2nd as the International Day to End Impunity for Crimes Against Journalists. And, th and this day has been observed actively by organizations of working journalists around the world. This reflects growing alarm and anxiety over the safety of India, the safety of journalists, and governments, the security establishments, and even judicial authorities in India have been distressingly insensitive to the seriousness of this issue. The CPJ's Impunity Index is released annually uh, on November, every year, November 2nd, and soon we'll have this report uh, for 2019. And its latest report calls attention to the fact that, of, uh, as I said, of the 14 countries that figure uh, uh, in the list, five of them 
have failed to respond to the UNESCO Director General's request for information on the status of investigations into the journalist murders. Who are the five countries? India, Pakistan, Syria, Iraq, and South Sudan. Ending the state of impunity and the underlying lack of accountability must be taken up as a democratic task of the highest priority. This, so I think uh, the, cha the main challenge before investigative journalism is uh, th th this, this, this question of uh, fear, danger to the investigative reporter. Uh, they, some, often they are abducted, tortured to send a message and then murdered. This is an international phenomenon, but unfortunately India seems to be in the thick of it, along with countries that, uh, you know, the, the company is quite, uh, uh, qu quite shocking. The, there are other challenges, internal challenges to investigative journalism. It's not just the external threat, what I've been talking about. But let me take up uh, two problematic issues that face reporters who investigate sensitive subjects. One is the frequent, almost endemic resort to deception. And secondly, dealing with anonymous and confidential sources. Now, uh, it is true that virtually every investigative journalist practices deception in some form. In the sense, you don't let those you are investigating know what you are up to, to the, if you can manage that. You, uh, so some element, some degree of uh, deception is involved in virtually all of investigative journalism. And any, any journalist who claims that I'm completely straightforward with sources that uh, would have to be dumb, would not succeed in, in anything. So deception in some, of some kind, you can only justify it by saying it's for the greater good. It's for getting something more valuable, uh, which would uh, justify or rationalize uh, uh, what, you, what, what you have done. You don't, you don't show your hand, in other words. You are not quite straightforward. So there is a, an endemic resort to deception. And then there's the problem of dealing with anonymous and confidential sources. The generally agreed rules, at least my rules, and this is not original, I think they've been worked out over time by many good journalists, but the rules I would advocate and practice uh, relating to the use of deception in investigation are quite clear. The problem is uh, with their implementation or other enforcement in newsrooms. How do you enforce these rules? The first rule prohibits resort to deception unless it becomes clear that the information sought by the journalist on a matter of significance cannot be obtained in a straightforward way. You can't go straight and ask them to give you that information. If it's about wrongdoing, tell, tell me what you've done wrong, etc. It's not possible. It has to be clear. It's not, it cannot be got in any other way than through the practice of some form of deception. The second rule is, requires that the public interest test be applied if the deception contemplated is serious and would not be countenanced in the normal professional course. Uh, there are people who go into mental asylums, uh, sometimes uh, claiming to be social workers or, uh, or mentally ill, and then they report. This has been particularly, this has been practiced in the United States. They've gone into prison systems, broken the law and gone into prison uh, and reported on what. And this has re resulted in very valuable, powerful material. But it has to be clear that the public interest is involved in this, if this deception contemplated is serious, where uh, you are pretending to be what you are not, or you are breaking the law, or coming close, or you are on the borderline of breaking the law. The third rule laid, uh, lays down that any investigation that relies on deception must be closely monitored by an editorial supervisor with sufficient experience to make calls on what is and what is not legitimate from the standpoint of professional ethics. It has to be supervised. So three rules. One, you couldn't have got it any other way. You have to resort to this. Two, that the public, there must be a public interest justification or defense 
for what you do if it's serious deception. And three, uh, you have to be carefully supervised. If those rules, uh, rules are followed, I think then investigative journalism can be on a sound path. And the kind of uh, uh, disasters that the New York Times uh, experienced with Judith Miller and so on would be avoided. Uh, and it's also happened in India. The other issue that I re refer to is the use and misuse of anonymous and confidential sources. This is a global phenomenon, a minefield that has claimed many casualties, such as Judith Miller, has also taken a toll of the public's trust in journalism. But the real problem of Indian journalists today is not so much the protection of anonymous and confidential sources. It is a license given to official, corporate, and often privileged sources to use and abuse its columns and broadcast time hiding behind the veil of uh, anonymity. If they are free from scruples, these sources are able to wield power and influence without responsibility, promoting official agendas and special interests, attacking and at times scandalizing opponents and opposing views, planting self-serving stories, and from time to time purveying just plain disinformation. Disinformation must be distinguished from misinformation. Scholars do it, but very often it's um, confused in journalism. Uh, disinformation is deliberate, intentional, malicious. Misinformation happens all the time in journalism and in public discourse. It is not deliberate, and it can be corrected. The responses have to be quite different. Since the justification for the demand for anonymity and confidentiality is rarely questioned by reporters, and since the deal struck routinely between reporter and privileged source to grant confidential source, uh, confidential status are rarely monitored and supervised properly within the newsroom, the misuse of sources by journalists, and what is even more damaging, the misuse of journalists and the news media by privileged and powerful sources have assumed epidemic proportions in India. You can see it today on reporting on Jammu and Kashmir, where there's been a clampdown and political leaders have been de detained. Very little uh, reliable reporting in the Indian press, including in the Hindu and, uh, uh, and so on. Uh, the, and the reports, the, the few reports that have come out, they're increasing now. You, you'll read them in The Guardian or the BBC or Reuters. And also I must mention especially Caravan magazine, which puts out long-form journalism, did a very fine cover story on this. And Arundhati Roy, one of our outstanding uh, writers who contributed greatly to investigation, but uh, in a literary form, uh, has done a, a story on that. Uh, but uh, there are, you know, given the gravity of the situation, the seriousness of what happened, I'm not getting into the details here. It's just that there's been a clampdown and there's been very little enterprising journalism, very little independent journalism, which seeks to inform readers and, uh, and uh, viewers, the audience, on what has actually happened in Kashmir. Is there resistance? Are there casualties? What is happening? How are the people taking it? You can operate within the frontiers of the law and do much better than what is being attempted today. So this is a major challenge. This is where the overarching climate of fear and intimidation operates and also self-censorship, which I mentioned earlier, that uh, even without being commanded to do it, you do it in advance. Like the, these lines about the British journalists, considering what the man will do unasked, there's no occasion to. I've had exper you know, some experiences in investigative journalism. Uh, in, in 1981, 1982, 1981, when I was Washington correspondent of the Hindu, the government of India had entered into an extended fund facility with the International Monetary Fund. At that time, it was uh, the largest multilateral loan in history. Uh, it was... Uh, 5 billion SDR, which was about 6 billion US dollars at that time. And the, uh, the uh, agreement involved conditionalities about how India should, India's economic policy and so on, uh, labor reform, uh, uh, 
exchange rate management, and a uh, number of other facets of uh, uh, ec economic policy. And uh, as a quid pro quo for this, the conditionalities were laid down. These days, these things are made public. But in 81, it was highly, uh, it, was, uh, it was classified, it was confidential, and governments as well as the IMF uh, were very careful in not uh, giving out these details. Uh, again, by a stroke of luck, uh, uh, these, uh, the document fell into my hands and uh, the Hindu was able to uh, serial, you know, carry in installments, uh, in fact serialize on a virtually daily basis uh, these documents. And I think uh, there was a lot of interest in India, it figured in Parliament. That was not some great feat of investigation. It was largely a stroke of luck. But you have to cultivate sources to do that. In the Bofors investigation, it was very long lasting. This happened in, uh, uh, you know, the Bofors scandal broke through uh, a broadcast by Swedish public radio in uh, April of 1987, when it was alleged that uh, uh, India's uh, purchase of howitzers from Sweden, from Bofors, involved uh, hefty bribes paid to public servants, defense officials, and others, uh, and also politicians. That is the allegation made, but the Swedish media then went silent, and uh, for two years, uh, for, for a whole year, nothing, nothing additional came out. Uh, the politicians were involved, the uh, VP Singh, original first finance minister, another time later defense minister, blew the whistle on another scandal and resigned on the issue of corruption. And I think uh, at that time, the many journalists, people like Arun Shauri and others were uh, in hot pursuit of, uh, of, of the fact, of the, of the truth in this case. In uh, April of 1988, we had uh, the Hindu struck gold, with, or rather Chitra Subramaniam, uh, then Stringer in Geneva, struck gold in, in Sweden, got a source, and we were able to publish uh, uh, the first documents on, on, on payments undisclosed payments disguised as commissions on a percentage basis paid into secret Swiss bank accounts. The information came little by little, not all in one go, uh, but it, uh, the investigation lasted for about two or two and a half years uh, before uh, you could say that there was some finality to it. It showed that uh, much was hidden. There was a money trail that was uh, tracked uh, in this investigation, and I happened to lead the investigation. It was not one person's effort. It was a team of journalists working here, and there were also competition from others. The Indian Express contributed, India Today contributed, but uh, on the whole, the Hindu led this investigation. And it is generally uh, uh, agreed that this had a significant impact on the election of 1989. And which contributed, which, uh, and the defeat that the Rajiv Gandhi government suffered in 1989. They were still the leading party in parliament. Uh, I don't think, it, I think it would be an exaggeration to claim that this is what uh, brought about the downfall of the Congress government at that time. There were many other issues involved. It was a complex situation, but the general perception is that uh, this was a very significant, this had a very significant impact on the political scene uh, and so on. The, uh, it's another matter that it led to nothing happened in the investigation, in the, in the legal process, in the criminal justice system. And not as uh, some of the accused during that time, uh, others, uh, you know, were, they were all acquitted. Not, there was not a single conviction uh, in the Beaufort's case. But uh, so that uh, the lesson I drew from that was that you shouldn't bother too much about uh, the impact, uh, the outcome of your investigation. Just do it because uh, very often what happens in the, in the, in the public sphere, in, in the political arena is, is, you know, is much more complex than uh, journalists often imagine 
and it's largely outside your control. So the proper task of journalism is to do the investigation and put it out there. And of course you want, you want it to have an impact in a subjective way, but you have no control over it.